Let me now introduce the panel for our first panel discussion. International Arbitration, the Challenges and Changing Landscape. The eminent panelists are the Honorable the Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon of the Supreme Court of Singapore, Mr. Edwin Tong, SC, Minister for Culture, Community and Youth, and Second Minister for Law of Singapore. The Honorable Justice Anselmo Reyes of the Singapore International Commercial Court, Mr. Gary Bourne, President of the SIAC Court of Arbitration, and Chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Wilmer, Cutler, Pickering, Hale, and Door LLP. Professor Lawrence Boo, member of the SIC Court of Arbitration, an independent arbitrator at the Arbitration Chambers. And Ms. Natalie Morris Sharma, Deputy Senior State Counsel at the Singapore Attorney General's Chambers. Moderating this panel is Mr. Toby Landau QC, member of the SIC Court of Arbitration and Barrister and Arbitrator at Essex Court Chambers Duxton, Singapore Group Practice, and Essex Court Chambers London. We are delighted to welcome our distinguished moderator and panelists. Mr. Landa, please. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Welcome to everybody, uh, to all my uh, fellow panelists, and to the large number of people who have tuned in uh, in whatever time zone uh, you happen to be. This is a historic, event because it's the first virtual plenary session of the first virtual SIAC Congress. Uh, it's unclear whether this is a one-off or whether this is now a taste of the new normal, uh, and we'll see how, how well it works. In terms of format, um, the, uh, I have the easiest task, uh, which is to ask, ask the questions and direct the channel of flow of discussion. Uh, the harder task will be providing answers, uh, which I will not be doing. Uh, one of my tasks is difficult, which is to stay online, uh, speaking from Pakistan, as I will be at the mercy, as will all of you, I'm afraid, of the Pakistan telecommunications system. Uh, if things do not go to plan, uh, then I have a, a um, very reliable backup in the shape and form of Mr. Gary Bourne, who has agreed to step in uh, in case I disappear. And we have to give full credit, much gratitude to Gary, not only for stepping in, but also because he's doing so at about 3.28 a.m. in the morning, his time. Although you wouldn't be able to tell from his appearance, if I may say. Um, we're conducting this in a somewhat chaotic fashion, thanks to my lack of organization, as an open discussion. And what I propose to do uh, is to raise a number of issues um, uh, 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 according to a particular scheme. And in the meantime, we very much encourage questions from all of you watching. Uh, there'll be a function on your screen to ask questions. Um, if all goes well, they will appear on my screen and I can then put them to the panelists. So please do uh, use that function as we, as we go along. The topic for the panel is international arbitration, the challenges and changing landscape. I think it may be fair to say that when that title was first set, nobody had any idea about quite how much the landscape would change and how rapidly it would do so. Uh, the title is one that has now become of particular significance uh, and it raises a number of points that we will address. Uh, I'm going to split this up into, at least in the first instance, two broad uh, issues or categories of issues. The first is to take the opportunity to open up a discussion on the Chief Justice's extraordinary keynote address. That raises a, a whole range of issues, very much live, um, quite apart from the pandemic. After that, we will come to pandemic related issues uh, in order to assess the landscape as it now is in these extraordinary times. So to get the ball rolling, uh, in terms of addressing issues arising out of the keynote address. It, it, it was, if I may say, an extremely thoughtful, um, fascinating analysis. And I want to abuse my position by asking the first question, um, actually, um, um, uh, of, of the Chief Justice uh, on the keynote address um, in order to play out some of, some of the issues. 
the thesis, I, I think, is that we're presented in the keynote with a new mechanism in order to test international arbitration. Uh, and in particular, to assess whether the trade-offs that have been taken with respect to rule of law are justified. The, the question I want to start with uh, to, to the Chief Justice is in your ICA address in 2012, which was an address that uh, made a big mark in this area and has been referred to repeatedly ever since, you spoke of a golden age of arbitration and you gave in, in many ways a health check for international arbitration. That was eight years ago. Um, how many of the frailties or the conditions that you now identify have actually just remained over those eight years unchanged? If you gave a health check now, even using the, the parameters that you're now using with rule of law, would it be the same as in 2012? Thank you, Toby. Uh, thank you for the kind remarks and uh, thank you for your question. Um, when I spoke in 2012, uh, I, I wasn't adopting um, the same sort of structured framework that I proposed today. Um, and, and I was approaching it more from the point of view of looking at what I thought some of the major challenges were that faced arbitration at that point in time. And if I were to um, isolate two or three of the points that really, really stood out to me at that time, I saw arbitration at a, at a stage of explosion. I, th I think the growth of arbitration and the range of participants that it was ex attracting at that point in time was just exploding uh, and, and growing almost geometrically all over the world. And one of the, the big, con a couple of the big concerns I had, uh, which I spoke about at that time was um, the fact that uh, I, I was concerned that there was a lack of consensus or consensual understanding. If you recall, I said that, you know, it was all well and good to talk about a shared set of assumptions and values when you had a small club uh, of people who are familiar with one another and who understood and more or less uh, came from the same sort of uh, philosophy towards um, the process, then you could talk about shared values and shared understandings. So one of the concerns I had was that uh, as, as the uh, field was democratizing, as it was exploding exponentially, you couldn't speak about that shared set of assumptions or shared set of premises. And I was very concerned that you were going to have a mismatch of expectations. And you could have uh, people coming to the same sort of problems with very different perspectives. And just to take an example, I spoke about this when I gave the Herbert Smith Lecture 2016, which I referenced in my keynote address on the subject of party appointed arbitrators. I have a personal view on whether party, arbitrator, party appointed arbitrators are good or not. But when I gave the Herbert Smith uh, address, and even this morning, I'm not taking that view, and I think that it's it's really become an entrenched part of arbitration practice that I, I don't propose to spend a lot of time suggesting that we should dismantle it or take it apart. But I, I did argue in 2016, and I do continue to argue, that it is very important that there be some sort of shared understanding as to exactly what is legitimate in terms of how you deal with a party appointed arbitrator. What can you do? How can, you know, how far can you go in reaching out to the party appointed arbitrator? In the 2016 lecture, I suggested, for example, that parties should be encouraged to keep a verbatim note of all their discussions with their prospective uh, appointee. And after the appointment, make that available to the other party. I said that would go a long way towards promoting um, uh, scrutiny, transparency, promoting the legitimacy of the of the institution. Um, now, I think when I spoke in 2012, I identified this as one of the challenges in arbitration, not localized to party appointed arbitrators, but generally this fact that you might have missed expectations. And I'm using this as an example. I think that problem is still there. I think today we, we look at it, there is still uh, a number of areas where there is a lack of consensus or, or common understandings as to how you approach potentially difficult issues. And the, the, those differences in common understandings can give rise to missed expectations, can give rise to 
um, missteps can give rise to problems that ultimately will affect the legitimacy of arbitration. So I think that's still a, a, a current issue. Um, uh, an issue I spoke about in 2012, which I think is, is huge and continues to uh, affect arbitration is the point I touched on today as well, uh, that James Alsop touched on in 2018. It's the whole question of the cost and uh, the, the, the burdensome uh, uh, process. Uh, now, I think, I think there are different things that contribute to this. I think that uh, James Alsop identified a number of factors in his keynote address. Um, but I think that there is another factor, which I'm also in the process of developing for another lecture that I'm supposed to give next month. And that is, I think we have to recognize that the sheer complexity of the issues has just escalated dramatically. We have to recognize that fact. And that is not peculiar to arbitration. I think that's just a reality that affects uh, many species of international commercial dispute resolution. But leave that to one side. I think that the criticisms about speed, inefficiency, uh, delays, cost, those are still very much an issue. And if you applied your health check analysis to that 10 years later, I think most people or many people would say that's still an issue. Um, so yes, Toby, I, I, I think it's a, it's a different model of analysis that I'm suggesting we look at. And I'm encouraging the community to look at this periodically. Um, but I would say that there are some of the issues that I identified in 2016, uh, 2012, that continue to um, um, be raised today. Um, and, and, and as I said in my keynote address, if you compare your speech in 2009 with James Dalsop's uh, in 2018, the fact that similar things are being said a decade apart suggests that some of these issues haven't gone away. And, and one then wonders what the future holds. And my concern is that I think that despite the tremendous advantages arbitration has as a species of dispute resolution, and despite the tremendous effort that the world has put into creating a framework for supporting international arbitration through the convention, the model laws, and so on and so forth, if, if people start thinking that arbitration is just become too complex and burdensome for effective use, then I think we will uh, have lost something in the process. And I don't think we can take it for granted that that won't happen. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice, for that. I think there are, there are a number of points that come out of that. Um, one, one of them, I think, is a, um, a certain diplomacy in your answer about um, the fact that some points um, have not been resolved and might still be current. Um, one could take a harsher view and say that actually one's experiencing Groundhog Day with almost every international conference because we keep talking about the same thing, which we've been talking about for years, which is how do we address the cost, uh, the lack of efficiency, the burdensome aspect, and perhaps now in the new calibration that you've provided to us, the lack of proportionality between arbitration and, uh, and the actual disputes. Um, it, it may be that disputes have become more complex, but arbitration is supposed to be singularly well suited to be flexible and deal with that. So, so, so will in, in eight years time, will, 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 will we be back here talking about the same points? And, 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 if, and, if, and how, do we avoid that? how do we avoid that? So I, I, I want to suggest that maybe we should be really open to some radical rethinking on some of these issues. I mean, you've, you've highlighted um, in, you know, one of the points you wanted to talk about as the uh, uh, being the subject of uh, due process paranoia and the question of whether that is uh, an issue that uh, is causing part of the problem. I, I do think we need to take a step back and revisit this whole thing. If you look at what has led to the, the growth of the complexity and, the, and the, in the processes and the cost of arbitration, a lot of it has been tied, in my view, this is my view, I may be wrong, but this is my view, a lot of it is tied to the fact that arbitration is a one-shot um, uh, appeal, a uh, one-shot uh, process. You have to get, get your result before the tribunal because the chances of getting it corrected, the chances of getting it reviewed are next to nothing, are low. 
you can almost can't get it reviewed on on the merits, and you're then left with the uh, formal grounds, the due process grounds, and the uh, formal grounds and the convention and the model law. So a lot of it, a lot of the effort, a lot of the attention, a lot of the cost is front loaded. And, and that becomes an immense uh, investment in time, in cost and effort. And a lot of the time, we are not particularly well suited to tackle these very, very difficult issues at such an early stage in the process. One of the advantages of litigation is that as the issues go through the process, by the time they reach the apex court, they've distilled and then a lot of attention is directed to some very narrow or fine issues and you can get those right. So, so I, I think that that is a reality and, and, and the problem is with this uh, one step approach, uh, if we combine that with the recognition that arbitration allows us the flexibility to customize our measures in a way that is truly cost efficient, I wonder whether we should really be rethinking the willingness to do things like seriously limiting, um, you know, how much time, how much uh, 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 attention, how much cost is going to be incurred on discrete issues at the at that stage, so that it doesn't become, um, a, a, you know, a, a given way of doing business, as James also complained of in the ICA Congress address uh, two years ago. So I do think we need to rethink this because otherwise you're right, in eight years time we'll be back and not much would have changed except maybe the, the number of cases coming to arbitration may have been diverted. And I see mediation, really, I see mediation as being the, the, uh, um, uh, the biggest sort of uh, beneficiary of the state of affairs in terms of where I see uh, work uh, being diverted away from, from arbitration. Can I ask Justice Reyes? In eight years' time, do you think you'll be back here speaking about the same issue? Uh, I'm afraid so. I, I, I think it will take a much longer time than eight years to change matters. The Chief Justice touched a moment ago on shared values and having shared values. Um, I think it's all right if you're talking about, say, enforcing an arbitral award in, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, where um, the notions of due process where the notions of public policy are more or less the same and uh, Hong Kong, Singapore cite each other's jurisprudence. But what, in, what about enforcing an award or getting an award set aside in other uh, jurisdictions, say in Asia, especially including Southeast Asia? Uh, my experience is that different judiciaries, different arbitral tribunals have very different ideas about what is or what is not due process what would or would not be consistent with public policy. So in order to have shared values across the board, even in Asia or Southeast Asia, I think one will have to have, um, well, SIAC, for instance, sends delegations out to discuss with judges points of view in relation to arbitration, uh, sends delegations to law schools to try to discuss with students what would be a, a proper or common approach to due process. I think it, it's a matter of education, of reaching out and discussing with judges and with future law students, the future arbitrators, future counsel, how exactly these things might be approached in a way that would be acceptable across the board for everyone. And that will take um, more than eight years, I'm afraid. What, what about the uh, Chief Justice's point about there needing to be more of a fundamental rethink of the process itself. So as opposed to simply spreading the word and reaching a common understanding of the existing system, is it time now to start rethinking the system itself? I would agree with rethinking the system, but the problem is not whether I would agree or not. Uh, the problem is that the moment you suggest rethinking the system, there will be a thousand academics everywhere in the world um, saying, no, well, there's this, there's that, there's this problem, there's that problem, and then we're back to having the same discussion. So it's all very well to talk about rethinking, but uh, rethinking is rather difficult. To some extent, COVID-19, which we'll be coming to, has forced upon us a rethink and is continuing to do so. It may, unfortunately, need events like that to catalyze or to, to bring in uh, significant change.
Can I? Yes. Toby, may, may I cut in just to, to make one point with your permission? I, I'm inviting everybody to cut in uh, at all times. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to, to make one point. I, I, I alluded to the fact that I'm, I'm working on, a, on another paper and in the research for that, I came across this uh, example of a, of a live case where um, the submissions reached and you know the, the written submissions in the case reached a length which um, the writer calculated that if if the arbitrator spent six minutes a page um, the arbitrator would take the best part of a year to finish reading the submissions and 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 that presupposes that a year later you remember what you read um, at the beginning of that year and that's just given us an example of how if we don't fundamentally start to rethink our approach towards some of these issues, we are going to end up with just losing control, I, I think. Um, I'm hoping that's not one of my cases. Um, <laughs> the, um, I, I want to just turn this over to Natalie, if I may, because I think the uh, context for this discussion is broader than just the regular commercial arbitration model. Um, and, and I want to ask Natalie, how, how would you see this question about recurring unresolved criticisms in the context of investor state arbitration? Um, thank you very much, Toby, and good morning to everyone. Uh, it's interesting, I think, that for once, perhaps we might uh, see the multilateral sector take a little bit of a lead um, and in perhaps moving a little bit faster on some of these reform issues. The, in the ISDS context, as many would be aware, there is an ongoing multilateral process that's looking into the issues of reform of investor state dispute settlement. So I was just thinking about what my response to the eight year question would be. Would we be back here talking about the same issues? Uh, perhaps in the context of ISDS, the question would still be yes. Um, but the difference would be that that radical rethinking is already happening now. Um, it's not without controversy. And so why we might be coming back is because we might still end up with the same system that we have now only with some tweaks. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but we could also have a new system. And so we might still come back in eight years time speaking about the same issues. Uh, but it could also be a stock take at that point in time, uh, having done the rethinking now. And perhaps to give some examples, drawing from CJ's keynote, uh, for instance, with regards to party appointment, one of the, the proposals on the table is to do away with party appointments altogether in the investor state context. And it's a bit too early to say where the chips will fall, but already in the context of that conversation, we've heard a lot more um, uh, radical or, or uh, creative ideas being put forward about how we may alternatively strike the balance with party appointments. So it's not just about a party making an appointment per se, but you could have lock drawing, for example, from a pre-established list. Um, or you could have institutional appointments taking a, a much for, more for, of a forefront role. And then in the context of um, appeal, there's actually been quite some support amongst delegations in the context of the discussions for an appeal mechanism to be introduced, at least for um, errors of law and manifest errors of fact. And this appeal would lead not so much to a referral back to the first instance court, but some delegations have even suggested that the, the appellate mechanism would be able to render the final decision. And so the same issues are coming up. Um, and I think it's because what, uh, what CJ has identified are really the classical yardsticks for measurement. They would apply both in the commercial arbitration context as well as in the investor state context. Uh, but at the moment, we've got different tra tracks or treads that are proceeding uh, in ISDS as opposed to what we see happening in the commercial world. Could I echo what uh, Natalie has said? And I, I think there are changes going on in IESDS, slowly, gradually. I, I, like her, I don't think eight years will be enough, but there are changes. Uh, take, for instance, Fair and Equitable Treatment, FET. Um, for many, many years, over 50 years, people have been talking about what is the minimum standard for fair and equitable treatment. And that's such a vague expression. Um, and no one can say anything beyond there is some sort of minimum standard determined by um, customary international law. But now there's a, a growing number of academic writings and there's a growing number of discussions about FET as a matter of proportionality and legitimate expectations. 
a, a balancing exercise along the lines that the Chief Justice spoke about, a balancing between the interests of the investor and the legitimate public uh, uh, interests of the state, the legitimate expectations of the investor against uh, the uh, public interest of, of the state. And balancing that out is what FET is about. Um, that is a change, I think, that is coming all along gradually. So there is promise in ISDS. What if, if, I may, um, if I may chime in, Toby, I, I think um, I, I agree with the observation that in respect, if we in eight years' time, will we be back to some of these questions? My answer to, is partly yes and no, because I think some of the questions, for example, CJ's talk, uh, the, the issue of costs and uh, time, it's, it's a perennial thing. Every time we'll be talking about this, and I don't think there's a right answer or wrong answer or right time or wrong time to talk about it. Um, it is really a question for a legal profession rather than strictly for, actually, in, in my view, uh, uh, for the arbitral forum like us. But in the, uh, make an observation I'll make in terms of investor CIS yes, uh, sector uh, or domain, I think it's easier for rethinking because states are involved. States have a forum to discuss, whereas in international commercial arbitration, we have a disparate uh, forum to uh, discuss all these issues, and that's why there's repetition all the time. Having said that, I think CJ's several of CJ's suggestions and areas for us to concentrate or look into is worth considering and worth spending time and pausing and say whether there's a possibility of a reset button for that. For example, on confidentiality, I have been a great proponent of confidentiality. I speak on confidentiality, I thought it's a great idea. But I'm, I think his paper and his, the thoughts that he has suggested make me rethink. There is it not time to review in face of greater quest for transparency, public interest issues, big corporations, and the very exceptions that we created in our rules against uh, or for disclosure, like public companies may disclose to their shareholders or their exchange, sometimes make um, some of our rules really uh, unworkable. And also the inconsistency in the various disclosure regimes. For example, cases in Singapore, we kept it confidential, it's not published, in, it's anonymized in our reports. But the same case, if it is elsewhere in China and India, they are reported in full with names and parties and all, everything is revealed. So there's this inconsistency in the various disclosure regime. So maybe it's time for us to rethink, reset whether a new balance can be, can be found, whether we should rethink and discuss uh, openly uh, launch a re-examination of the need for confidentiality and really the users really appreciate it. Maybe in terms of secrecy and uh, trade secrets and commercial sensitivities, this may be areas we can bring fence. But other than that, what's the justification for confidentiality? There's a question I think I'm beginning to, uh, to buy in slowly. The other, the other area in which um, CJ mentioned is the right to a uh, right answer. Is there, is the answer, is, is it, um, have not parties, which I do not fully agree, when he says that they, there is no right to a right answer, I know he's quoting, but um, is a party's right is to have the right judgment uh, or, or the judgment of the rightness by the chosen adjudicator. So I thought that would be the uh, bottom line. Uh, but of course, they must not be egregious and uh, maybe exceptions against can be created for that. And perhaps an appellate tribunal within the arbitral system Maybe the answer rather than uh, maybe some people are taking appeals to the courts. Quick, sorry for rambling through. Not, 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 not at all, not, not at all. But you, you, you've been capturing a lot of different points. Each one would, uh, it's going to take a long time to go through. And, I, and I've, I've got a long list, which will probably uh, frighten everybody. I won't reveal it of all, of all the questions we can ask on each of these points. But I just want to come back to one, if I may. Before. Sorry, Minister, please. Now, just going to weigh in on some of the points that Lawrence had raised and uh, perhaps offer a view this way. Uh, we, we must not forget that the international arbitration was really set up as a mercantile alternative to dispute resolution by the courts. And, and I think therein lies the difference in the quality of the arbitration. And I don't mean it from a quantitative perspective, but really in the features that you expect to see in an arbitration. So on Lawrence's point, why confidentiality? I think it's because people started with the notion that you didn't want to have your disputes splashed all over the papers in a public domain. You wanted to protect some disputes over trade secrets and so on. Why do you have party appointment? Because one started with the belief that in a particular context of a dispute, there's expertise, there's technical knowledge and domain knowledge. Uh, 
over which a particular particular training of a tribunal would be relevant and useful. And I think that's the bargain that one goes into an arbitration for. So I, whilst I agree that I think we need to look at the rethink and how, where this is going to be, and I certainly don't want to have a conversation now, eight years or any number of years from now with the same kind of topics. And if your and uh, CJ's uh, views as articulated in the paper uh, is extrapolated, we'll be here in another 10, maybe 15 years again. So I think we need to separate the, the different uh, desires in the two processes. If you want to choose an arbitration, then I think the quid pro quo is that you expect that there will be a degree of confidentiality and you, you want that. You want to be able to choose and nominate your uh, arbitrator. Though I must say I read with some alarm uh, and I heard some alarm CJ's uh, numbers in the papers. I think they, as he says in the paper, the numbers speak for themselves and I think that's quite alarming. But subject to that, I think those are the features that make arbitration attractive. Finality is also a key. Uh, so whether we go into arbitration with an appellate process or not is important. And in that context, I think one of the points we'll discuss later on is whether we should give parties a chance to build into the process the right of an appeal. Uh, there are views on both sides of the equation on that one. But where I lean in favor of a lot more reform really is in the cheaper and faster elements of arbitration. It started off as being cheaper, faster as an alternative to the court disputes, and one went through the process in expectation that you would end up uh, with a resolution, with a, with a dispute resolved sooner. And I think many, many of us around the table would agree that that's no longer an assumption one can make when you go into an arbitration. And I think that's something that is quite within the domain of institutions and perhaps policymakers to, to look at and to sort out. Uh, CJ mentioned, you know, a, a long arbitration. And I think that's, that's got to do with the way in which we manage the cases. Uh, you need to set some rules as to what you can say and how you can say it in, in a way that is no different from where we are in the courts anyway. If you end up in the court and you end up wasting time, you have a process that deals with it. And there can be no, there's no reason why you can't institute the same kind of discipline as you now see in case management conferences in the court system with arbitration. And I think that's something we can work at. But I, I, would, I would caution that there are features of an arbitral process that is market-driven, that parties want to see and want to have, and they gain and they benefit from those. So I, I would say, look at the process, but uh, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Thank you, Toby. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the, the, the analysis, as I understand it, um, that the Chief Justice has, has provided, puts this, it puts it in a rule of law context. So that on the one hand, we've got the things that the market wants. So they may want confidentiality. They may want party appointments. On the other hand, we, we have the fact that that causes the rule of law model to be attenuated, in the Chief Justice's words, because there are trade-offs. Because what that means is that if you want it, you can have it, but you're going to lose a, a rule of law value, or a rule of law value is going to be constrained as a result. That's how I've understood the test. But that surely puts the focus on what that trade-off is. And it's not just, isn't it right that it's not just a question of what the market wants? Because if one looks at this in a rule of law context, there may be negatives for society as a whole if a large portion of this dispute resolution space is occupied by an arbitration model that doesn't meet these particular standards. So, so the question then may still be, well, what is the, is, is, is the trade-off worth it? Uh, are the benefits good enough? Is, is, is party autonomy perhaps the only answer? Or should we really be looking more clearly at, at, at making it more efficient, cost-effective? Yeah, Gary, what, what's, what's your take? Thank you very much, Toby. Um, and thank, thanks to all the other panelists and the Chief Justice for a, a fascinating speech. I think in eight years, we'll be talking about the same things that we're talking about this evening and that we talked about eight years ago. I also think that SIC's caseload will, as it has increased 60 or 70 percent over the last eight years, will increase another 60 or 70 percent in the coming eight years because users continue to value arbitration. They, often want to combine it with mediation, which 
from arbitration's perspective is a good thing. It enables the process to resolve disputes more quickly. I think it's important though, as the minister pointed out, that we, whether in the form of Jan Paulson's radical revision or otherwise, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. One of the reasons that we continue to talk about issues of time and cost is to enable institutions, more importantly, to enable parties to come up with solutions, incremental solutions, to make the process move more quickly and efficiently. SIC's rules on expedited procedure, early dismissal and the like are classic examples of that. And in fact, arbitrations today, many arbitrations under the SIC rules are concluded much more quickly than they were eight years ago. Obviously, larger cases, more complex cases take longer, but nobody wants them to go that quickly, in fact. I think it's important, therefore, to, as the minister also pointed out, recognize that one of the fundamental attributes of the rule of law is respect for party autonomy, and in particular, the commercial freedom of merchants, of parties, whoever, wherever they may be. That's especially true in the international context where the requirements for international neutrality, international enforceability are, are paramount to the rule of law. Giving effect to parties' agreements to arbitrate and not imposing from the top down some solution, whether it be transparency or some other um, idealized version of the rule of law inhibits something that has worked for thousands of years and which over the last eight and I'm sure over the coming eight years will continue to flourish. There's, there's a question that has come in which actually I, I wanted to put in any event, which is about the Prague rules. So the Prague rules is a, a, a sort of civil law answer to uh, the common law based IBA rules in a way. The idea is in the Prague rules to set up more of an inquisitorial structure so that the initiative is taken by tribunals and we move away from the common law model where the tribunal sits uh, ready to be educated, but sits passively. And so that traditionally there's only limited case management. Um, Chief Justice, can I ask you, would that be an answer to the issue you raised about the problem of there being only one shot. Um, Toby, I, I want to come to it with a prelude, if I may. Um, and, and the prelude is an important one. I, I, I think I made the point three times in my uh, paper, and, and it's worth making it a fourth time. Uh, and, and, and that point I want to make is that I am not uh, advocating a particular balance. I'm encouraging a method of thinking about these issues. I'm not advocating a particular balance. I'm, I'm not today taking a view on transparency or on um, confidentiality or on any of those issues, because I think that's, um, uh, uh, those are questions that the arbitral community are best placed to um, think about and to come to a view on. What I am encouraging is um, the, the, the importance of or the possibility of using this framework as a method of analysis to recognize that, as you, as you very, very uh, articulately put it, to recognize that you may be giving up something by going down a particular path, and at least recognize that fact and assess whether it is worth the price or not. That's what I'm encouraging. And, and the thing that I am, uh, the one thing that I am taking uh, issue with um, is, is this question of speed and cost and efficiency and delay, which has continued to plague us and, and will likely continue to plague us in some way, shape or form in the coming years. And, and I do think, and this leads into your question in relation to the Prague rules, I do think that it is because there is nothing that you are getting, I think, of value in giving up that uh, aspiration of speed and, and efficiency and, and practicality, that you need to scrutinize that very, very carefully and ask yourself why you're prepared to give that up. Now, this feeds into two points. Uh, Lawrence made the point, I think, very, very correctly, 
that the ISDS space is a slightly, is a very different space from the commercial arbitration space because in ISDS, the states have a direct interest and they are allowing themselves to be sued and therefore they can, they have a direct interest in setting out the terms or grounds on which they will allow themselves to be sued. Um, they have a direct interest and I, I anticipate that we will see uh, more changes in the overall framework for ISDS than we will see in commercial arbitration because commercial arbitration is a space where that doesn't, uh, uh, that is not the case. Commercial arbitration through the years has largely evolved from the ground up. Uh, Gary has spoken on many occasions of the importance of recognizing that fact and I respect and recognize that fact. But what I am saying is that also means that the stimulus for change is going to be uh, less easily received and, 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 and perhaps even to emerge and result in positive change. And that's a concern that we need to have. So that leads to the question of, of thinking about how we deal with the question of, of costs. And, and I accept that there has been a, a real growth in things like expedited procedures and, and a variety of, of means by which uh, genuine efforts have been made to develop simplified uh, processes for the resolution of dispute by various, uh, various institutions, which is to be encouraged. I question though, whether uh, it is necessarily the case that those types of analysis, those types of thinking are inappropriate once you get out of the smaller claims. And there is a tendency to view this as uh, an, an, in an analog to the, to the court practice, to view this as um, simplified process for small claims. Of course, nothing is small in arbitration. When we speak of small claims in arbitration, we're not talking about small claims the way we speak of them. We're still talking about very, very large claims, but in relative terms. And I question whether that is ne a necessary limit or a limitation on the extent to which we can re uh, uh, view and reimagine some of the answers. And that's the place that things like the Prague rules come into their own. I, I'm not saying that I, I think we must go down that path, but those kinds of things have to be seriously considered if we're going to make a dent on how expensive and how explosive costs have become for large scale cases. We've seen cases where you know, the claims might have gone into a couple of hundred million, the, the fees have gone to 25% of that. And I, I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem. And we need to think about whether that's, you know, A, justified, and B, if it's resulting in submissions that are thousands of pages that people aren't really going to be able to absorb, is that really something that we want to just let carry on? Now, at the end of the day, the reform has got to come from the ground up because, as Gary says, you can't impose a solution to these things. But yes, I do think we should be thinking about, um, you know, completely innovative responses to some of these problems, even in the remit of these larger claims, and not work on the presumption that for the larger claims, well, you know, it's, it's large enough, we should just let it uh, take its course. I wonder if I could make two points. Uh, one is in relation to the Prague rules, and the second is uh, in relation to what the Chief Justice has said and what the Minister has said. The first in relation to the Prague rules, I'm not sure that the Prague rules are going to help. Um, they encourage uh, a tribunal to be more proactive, but what is being proactive? What is being over-robust? Um, it, it, it seems to me that it doesn't give any guidance to a tribunal as to what is due process uh, or what is acceptable uh, in terms of uh, the rule of law uh, criteria that the Chief Justice um, uh, talked about a moment ago. Secondly, in terms of what the Minister has said and what the Chief Justice said just now, um, given that international commercial arbitration is market driven, you don't want to lose that element. Perhaps achieving the balance between um, the attenuated rule of law in the um, uh, in international commercial arbitration and ensuring that there is at least a minimum rule, of law, a minimum standard, a minimum fairness or legitimacy 
that is uh, within arbitration. Perhaps that's a question of the balance between the role of the tribunal and the role of the court. The court ensures that there is a sufficient rule of law element in each arbitral award uh, through uh, Article 5.1 and Article 5.2 of the New York Convention or the equivalent in the model law in setting aside applications. In other words, the court decides whether due process has been followed and the court decides whether an arbitral award is or is not contrary to the public policy of a given state. Um, this is the way that the court can control whether an award has gone too far off the limb, is too attenuated in terms of its rule of law, or it has struck an appropriate balance. Isn't, isn't one of the key problems uh, the fact that everybody seems to be on autopilot? So that when, when a case comes in, uh, everybody, uh, arbitrators and counsel, um, get into a sort of uh, a manner of behavior that is the same for each case. Uh, procedural order number one is printed. Uh, people talk about flexibility. They talk about the, the potential to do things differently, but actually they don't. Now I can see Gary disagreeing, so I'm handing straight over to Gary on this one, if I may. I do disagree with that, that Toby. Uh, obviously, every arbitration starts with, I guess, the request for arbitration, but quickly ends up with procedural order number one. But equally, in almost every arbitration, procedural order number one is preceded by detailed negotiations between parties counsel about how most efficiently to run the case and how to ensure that both parties have an opportunity to, to present their case. I think that in a sense, it goes back to the notion of a ground up solution and the party's autonomy. Just as the parties want to be able to choose arbitrators, not for nefarious reasons so that they have a party appointed arbitrator in their pocket, but instead as a means of quality control, instead of a random selection of a decision maker, choosing someone who is most expert for the particular dispute. So the parties want to design a procedure that best suits their dispute. And in my experience, and I think yet our experience institutionally at the SIAC, parties very frequently do that. Arbitrations are like snowflakes. Everyone has its own special characteristics depending on the parties and the nature of their dispute. Sometimes that produces long drawn out um, procedural timetables. A nuclear plant malfunctioning in Scandinavia results in a 10 year arbitration, which may seem horrendous, but which the parties actually thought suited their, their dispute perfectly. Um, and I think, therefore, it's wrong to say that we default to a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. In fact, beneath the surface of procedural order number one are a number of very complicated trade offs where parties decide things like do we want the Prague rules or do we want the IBA rules? If we want the IBA rules, how do we want disclosure? structured? What do we want our hearing if we have one to look like? And so I think, in fact, arbitration in a very substantial number of cases, obviously they're outliers, but in a very substantial number of cases, in fact, realizes its objectives, which is why caseloads continue to increase year on year. Lawrence, do you agree? Oh, no, I, I think I, I share quite, quite a bit of your, what you have said earlier, in fact. Um, I am myself have been at times guilty of, of doing the same, like uh, treat every case or starting it the same way. But I learned along the way, you know, that um, uh, different parties need different styles, especially if they come from different uh, legal uh, background. And um, if I deal with uh, Chinese or Indonesian parties, I, I would really like to see uh, uh, not a preset procedural order number one that I throw at the parties. In fact, I don't throw the parties the PO1 as some others may do. Uh, maybe I'll set a timetable, a, 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 a performa timetable for them to discuss. But I think you're right to say that um, we should treat every case differently. A procedural, long procedural number one as to how documents should be paginated, all these details need not be there. I mean, and, uh, and uh, setting out how they should plead their case should not be there. I mean, these are details I, I don't want to go into, but I, I think you're absolutely right. There should not be too much of 
too rigid in the way we have uh, always described it as informal, but actually we uh, make it less flexible as we go along. I think we have that tendency to do what we used to do as it was at the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. So that is something we need to change maybe. In terms of cost, if I may just add in there, is that historically, of course, we are talking about less uh, cheaper and faster, but we must not forget that this is the, the classical or historic arbitration cases are the uh, quality of cotton, wood, uh, you know, spices. If you go really back, we're talking about that kind of dispute. So what we're dealing now with it now is quite different. So we are we're talking about different scale, different time, time frame as well. Thank you. One of the uh, deterrents to innovation or even to change the basic model is due process paranoia. It's something Chief Justice mentioned earlier. Uh, and that, that may be one key point that one might focus on uh, to, to see if there's a way, if there's an antidote, what is the best way to deal with it? Uh, because what it, what it may do is cause a paralysis on the part of tribunals to actually do anything different because they're, they're told if they do anything different, which is different from standard procedural order number one, then somebody is going to complain and apply to set aside later. Um, Toby, uh, in that context, can I, can I ask uh, uh, Justice and Selmo a question? I think earlier on, the judge mentioned that what's important is to seek a balance. And I think we all understand the points that go behind why CJ has said that we are now faced with an attenuated rule of law. And I think, uh, I mean, all of us as lawyers, we, 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 we grew up on the rule of law being a central pillar to almost everything that we do in terms of the process, the procedure, whichever forum you're in. Uh, but judge mentioned that it's possible to look at the balance as being struck between the tribunal and the court. And uh, also went on to say that the court could, and I, th I thought suggested that the court could perhaps have a slightly enlarged setting aside jurisdiction. I wonder whether that's, uh, that's correct as what judge has said. And how you know you think that might play out in practice because it fits into what you're saying as well in terms of the due process paradigm because all the tribunals are worried that you know they might not they might they could get the decision wrong on its merits but they can ill afford to get the process wrong and that's I think part of the problem so in perhaps finding that balance I mean does judge have any other views as to what else can be done to strike that balance and whether it is being suggested that the court have been enlarged uh, setting us jurisdiction and if so on what other grounds beyond the typical article 18 grounds thank you very much um, it's a difficult question when I um, said what I said earlier I was thinking in particular of the COVID-19 situation and public policy in particular um, a lot of um, jurisdictions a lot of countries Singapore um, may be one of them uh, are thinking of ways to protect their local businesses um, in this time of COVID-19 and it may be that protecting businesses in order to enable certain key businesses to survive in a given jurisdiction would come become part of public policy in the future. Public policy, the, our idea of what is a fundamental norm uh, within public policy may change over time. And COVID-19, for instance, may be a circumstance that causes us to develop further our notions of public policy. So there is flexibility in that sense. That's an Article 5.2 matter for recognizing or enforcing an award. In terms of setting aside, which is a specific focus of the minister's question, actually, uh, unlike the New York Convention, there is scope in setting aside applications to, for a jurisdiction to expand on the meaning of uh, what is public policy or what is a due process, because uh, the a jurisdiction adopts the model law and it is not bound by international obligations in respect of the model law in the sense that one is if one adopts the new york convention or exceeds to the new york convention one is bound by international obligations in the new york convention so the court may perhaps play have a greater role in setting aside applications in a um in a um, supervising uh, state uh, singapore for instance has put in additional grounds for setting aside that are not found in the model law. For instance, the fraud uh, uh, ground for, for setting aside. One can add grounds to setting aside to make clear what is, what is not a pub, uh, due process from the point of view of that particular state. That is, one can exp 
uh, for purposes of transparency, one can expressly state or try to state, articulate something of that sort in one's arbitration statute. I think that's the, the, the line that I was thinking of. Right, thank, thank you. I, I, I think that's important. Uh, and I'll just make one observation, which is that the, the, more we are, the more we can expand that list on which we can set aside a, an award, I think the more it cuts into the autonomy space because the parties have chosen arbitration for a reason. And I think what Gary said earlier, you know, one of the pillars of rule of law is also respecting party autonomy. And the more we, are, we make inroads on that, the more that, so it's a, it's, a, it's a zero sum game in some ways, because the more you give oversight, the less it is that there's party autonomy. And I, I don't think there's a right answer to this. And I think we just have to decide for ourselves what's the right balance to be struck, which goes back to the original point you made. Thank you. Toby, I, I, I want to say that, speaking for myself, I, I don't think we should expand or encourage um, uh, a wider sort of uh, role on the part of the courts to set aside awards on the grounds of due process. I think that would be a, a very negative step in my, in my respectful view, because I think that if what we are, um, I, I think we all agree, actually, that, that the root of arbitration, uh, you know, its, it's genesis, its, it's uh, uh, foundational norm is, is the fact of party autonomy and the consent of the parties. And, and, and what, what I'm arguing for is actually more innovative, imaginative approaches on the part of the uh, tribunal to come up with effective ways of dealing with this um, that may not be, as one of the comments uh, uh, noted, that may not be rooted in the old common law, necessarily the old common law style of doing things, you know. And, and I think that arbitrators really shouldn't be given any additional reason to think that their awards are, are at risk of being set aside by uh, an intrusive court that has a slightly different view of how, uh, or even a very different view of what due process requires. I mean, what you expect and what you get in court in this context is going to be different from what you expect and what you will get in arbitration. And, and I'm all for even you know, making that more different if arbitrators can be encouraged to be uh, innovative in addressing these issues. So I do not think that we should um, you know, expand the space for the courts to intervene in the context of due process. I think that uh, uh, you, know, you talk about due process paranoia. I think part of the problem with due process paranoia is tribunals tend to think that there is such a risk of being set aside. But if you look at it objectively, the number of cases where courts have set aside awards on the grounds of due process are, are very, very few. Um, and they really have to be something quite obviously a failure of, of process before the courts will intervene. And, and I think that is as it should be. That is entirely in keeping with the uh, you know, values of, of party autonomy, of, of consent, of, of, of their control over the process. But I do want to come back to a point that was made, uh, I think, by uh, Lawrence and, and, and I think by Gary. I'm not convinced myself. I don't have the uh, uh, empirical data. I'm not convinced myself that this is a problem of outlier cases. Because if it was a problem of outlier cases, the only empirical data we have are the QM, Queen Mary uh, survey results. And they wouldn't keep bleating on about this problem if this was an outlier problem. If everybody feels that arbitration is generally very well managed, and, and, and keep in mind, we have, we have thousands of arbitrators. We're not talking about the experts who are around this table, some of whom are around this table. But if everybody was satisfied with the fact that generally you get uh, effective, efficient, cost-saving arbitration, we wouldn't be having all these conferences. We wouldn't be bleating on about it year in, year out, decade in, decade out. So it, I don't accept myself on that basis that this is an outlier problem. I think it is an issue. I don't think there are easy solutions, but we must address this issue in my view, uh, because I think we owe it to the constituents. We owe it to the parties. And the real problem with private arbitration is the biggest experts are the people with the biggest economic stake in the game. It, you know, our fees, our, our income comes from this. So we have a direct interest in how much reform is going to uh, be introduced. That is the problem with private arbitration. So I, I, I think that that premise really, I don't, I don't personally accept that premise. Isn't, isn't there a tension between that and, 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 and the first point about trying to reduce the, the pressure on arbitrators of the risk of being set aside? 
And the more you insulate the process, the less accountable it becomes. No, on the contrary, what you want is to encourage arbitrators to feel that they have the support of the courts in being innovative. That's the point I'm, I'm making. If you say that that's going to mean that they're going to be less uh, 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 innovative, that's not the court's function. Our function is not to police that. That's for the market at the end of the day. And maybe the market will tolerate it, you know. But, but I see our role uh, as really being, uh, in terms of the court's role, as yes, I, I think it's almost said earlier on that the courts act as a last line of defense to check for real failures of due process. I see that as our role. But that means that arbitrators should approach cases with the confidence that generally courts are going to look at things with the recognition that it is a discretion that belongs to the arbitrators, how they structure the proceedings. Uh, Minister, can I, can I, sorry, Gary, go ahead and then I'll come to the Minister if I may ask that. Thanks very much, Toby. Uh, I agree with that entirely. And I think as well, the role of arbitral institutions in the process shouldn't be underestimated. Arbitral institutions can, through their fee structure, for example, at SIC, we have an ad valorem system which removes incentives for drawing out a case, and through their monitoring of individual arbitrations and making sure that arbitrators are fulfilling their mandate faithfully, ensure that the process lives up to the, the party's expectations. I think that is a critical aspect of trying to realize the the aspirations that the chief so well pointed out in his speech. Can I, can I look at the other end of the spectrum of party autonomy? And that is the extent to which parties should be able to contract into further scrutiny, into appeals, uh, and the extent to which parties can contract out of setting aside and minimum standards of scrutiny. Uh, Minister, perhaps I can ask you um, this was the subject of a, of a min-law consultation, which I believe is ongoing. Um, I don't know whether you're in a position to give us an update or, or tell us where you've got to. Yeah, thanks, Toby. I, I, I think um, you know, this is one of those examples where we went out to get a consultation and went out to market and got views, and we really had a range of views. Uh, many in favour of having the opt-in, many in, not in favour of the opt-in. And I think for a number of reasons. Speaking for myself personally, I, I think that this is, a, this is a step that goes to achieving two things. You give the party the right to opt in. It means that if the parties choose to have a further check on the system and on the process, then that's what the parties want. And in line with party autonomy, I think that is something that we should be giving and upholding. Uh, the second upside to this of course, is in dealing with one of CJ's points, which he articulated in the paper, and I think also in previous papers as well, which is the dearth of jurisprudence coming out from uh, arbitral decisions or curial challenges. And I think that's a serious concern because as we, as we go down this, this path, I mean, together with confidentiality, which I, which I think is a, is a measure that, as I said earlier, uh, belongs to the domain of arbitration and, uh, and the parties, then we are faced with a dearth of jurisprudence on what makes for good arbitration, what are some of the points that have been decided, including procedural points as well. So for these two reasons, you know, personally, I think that's something that should be considered favorably. But we've had a range of different responses. And I think uh, some, like Gary, have said we can have that, but we should also have the waiver uh, inside as well. So because of these responses, and we're still making our way through some of these things and talking to the re relevant stakeholders, we have decided to just move on two other less contentious points first. Uh, the first is the, the uh, question of enforcing confidentiality obligations. I think that really just uh, sets out the position that most of us understand anyway. And the second is in terms of the choice of uh, our, the appointment of the tribunal in the context of multi-parties. Uh, not really controversial, these two points, but I think the one that that has attracted the most debate and discussion has been whether we should opt in, whether we should do an opt out uh, as well, which we were not in favor of because that's less consonant with party autonomy. But that said, the range of different voices really tell us that there, there are, and if I may say this, there are, there are a number of also vested interests in, in the process by the different users of the system. And I think that's manifest in the kind of comments that we've received so far. 
can I ask uh, Justice Reyes, um, in view of the comments that you made earlier about the role of the court, what, what's your view about the ability of parties to contract out of setting aside? Um, in terms of setting aside, the recognition and enforcement is different. Um, in terms of setting aside, um, it seems to me that we've been talking about the principle of party autonomy. Nothing constrains the parties from agreeing that there are going to be more stringent grounds uh, for uh, the validity of an arbitration award or that there are going to be less stringent grounds. So parties can agree that in addition to the grounds found in the model law, for instance, in the International Arbitration Act, their um, uh, award can be set aside for a whole number of other reasons. They can agree to that. Or they might agree that certain grounds that are operative in the uh, model law will not be a basis for setting aside the award. Subject to the provisions of the International Arbitration Act, there may be some provisions that prevent parties from uh, opting out of particular grounds for setting aside. I think party autonomy will allow the parties to either be more stringent or more liberal. When it comes to recognition and enforcement of an award, the New York Convention is an international treaty, and therefore the parties are not able to just opt out. Um, under, I think, Article 7 of the New York Convention, yeah. in, an enforcing state can be more liberal than the New York Convention in terms of recognizing and enforcing an award, but it cannot be more demanding than the New York uh, Convention. Uh, that's an international obligation, so an enforcing state has to observe that. Uh, on that, I, I think um, it, the, the parties can agree. It, it, it's better to, uh, uh, the parties have a wide degree of um, agreement for setting aside applications. And I, can I also then put that back to uh, Chief Justice? Um, in terms of the rule of law analysis, how does, it, how does it fit to allow parties to actually take away all scrutiny of the court? I think, I think you, you are on mute, sorry. Thank you, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, 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 I was chuckling because I, I have actually spoken about this and in my view, um, party autonomy uh, weighs very, very strongly in favor of allowing parties to contract into a right of um, appeal uh, on points of law for the reasons that the minister uh, outlined. And I, I very much take that view. Um, of course, uh, Toby, if you apply the rule of law analysis, um, uh, you know, the exclusion of all rights of uh, review on the merits before the courts uh, compromises that right to an accurate outcome, which I personally think is very much a part of the rule of law framework. And notwithstanding uh, Lawrence's uh, suggestion to the contrary, I don't think you have that right in the typical arbitration because you cannot have your awards reviewed on the, on the merits and they're not scrutinized on the merits in general. Um, so I think it does, it does uh, entail uh, an attenuation in that regard. But I also understand why you choose that. And, and both Gary and the minister have outlined those reasons as I did in my paper, which is the parties want finality. And, and so that's a trade-off that you can well accept. Um, you can well accept it and say that's a trade-off that's legitimate because good, bad, or, or ugly, you accept the award. As long as it goes through a fair process, you accept the award, it's final and, and binding and you get on with it. Where I get troubled is when that comes without the concomitant benefits of having a process that is fast and efficient. Then I think we're giving that up without the trade-off. That's the concern that I have. And I think that remains a concern. We are... Um, uh, I mean, sorry. Yes, no, please, please do. Just, please. just on the setting aside in terms of uh, parties contracting uh, out of setting aside or the, or the grounds of setting aside. I think I will have a problem with that also because like, I agree with the Chief Justice, that compromises the rule of law. I mean, uh, the uh, grounds of setting aside in the Article 34 and um, similarly to the grounds of uh, refusal enforcement is a baseline check on the arbitrator's ability to uh, uh, govern the process to ensure that the process achieve what it's supposed to achieve. That is the rightness of the judgment. Hopefully, you know. So that is the baseline. I think we should not compromise that. It's something that I don't think party autonomy should trump that. Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to comment on my extraordinarily bad time management because we haven't got to COVID yet. 
and uh, we spent a long time on this uh, on this topic. There is, however, uh, one point I just wanted to raise very quickly, if you will allow me and forgive me, which I want to put to Natalie uh, before we then move into things viral, um, and that is the 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 debate that we've had. Uh, is very much about the shape and characteristics of a commercial arbitration model. And one curiosity is that for some reason, that commercial arbitration model has been adopted and applied to investor state arbitration, which might be very, very different in nature. And it may well uh, raise much, much more acute issues of the rule of law uh, in accordance with the Chief Justice's analysis. Uh, because the space in which investor state arbitration operates is really questioning sovereign discretion, whether it's judicial, executive or legislative. Uh, and in particular, it has the potential to impact on non parties rights and livelihoods and uh, their interests, which, of course, is one of the points which the Chief Justice has pointed out is essential um, it limits arbitrability. So I want to ask Natalie, how do you view this? If you look at it through the debate we've had, through the perspective of investor state arbitration, um, do, do, we, do we recalibrate this, uh, this debate? Do we, do we see it differently? Is it time perhaps to, to think of it without the constraints of the commercial arbitration model? Thank you very much, Toby. That's actually a really difficult question, I think, um, to, to get back on because, uh, one, one. yeah. Uh, so just to, just to give an attempt, I think it's true that, that in the context of um, in investment, investor state arbitration, there has been the criticism that there has been the erroneous privatization of public disputes. Um, but I wonder if uh, the fa underlying factors when you set up an arbitration system might still remain the same. Your, the reasons that you may do so and the reasons you may consider things like cost and time efficiency might be different because you have a state party. but you would still have that interest in issues such as cost and time efficiency and in the underlying uh, rule of law matrix that has been identified by uh, Chief Justice today. The other difference that I would highlight is that thankfully in the investor state context, um, to address these issues of things like the sovereign space for regulatory action, we have the overarching rubric of the investment treaty that sets up the uh, arbitra arbitral process. And in that offer in the investment treaty, you can address some of these issues, not just as part of due process considerations, but substantively. So things such as uh, police powers, uh, defenses, for example, can be written into the treaty. But even on the due process um, note, I would say that investment treaties today have have been the, the modern ones at least have been fairly forward looking. Um, the, the, the points that the Chief Justice raised in his keynote earlier about matters such as joinder and the involvement of third party and third party interests, these are issues that modern investment treaties already address. We've got joinder provisions, consolidation of claim provisions, um, the third party state to the investment treaty can be given a right to intervene even though it may not be um, the respondent state in a particular dispute. So to answer your question, um, I, I think we can still apply the same rubric. There might be a some shades of differences in the way that the analysis is carried out. Uh, and thankfully, um, we also have the additional consideration of the overarching treaty that helps us uh, to shape and frame a lot of the issues in the context of ISDS. I hope that goes yep. to your question. A masterful uh, summary in a short, in a short space of time. Thank you. Does, does anybody else want to add to that before we move on to uh, the virus? I, I just wanted to make uh, two points. I think, I think the um, treaty arbitration space uh, inevitably grew out of the commercial arbitration space because when states started to recognize that um, or, or states started to be willing to, to accept a, uh, the possibility of being sued directly by individuals under these uh, investment treaties, um, the, the most logical uh, source or process to borrow from was the commercial arbitration space. But I think that um, you know, over the years we've come to see that they are fundamentally quite distinct there are some similarities, but they're quite distinct. The consequences are quite distinct and the spaces that they regulate are quite distinct. And I think I've suggested in another speech and others have suggested in another speech that this is actually akin to an international body of administrative law governing governments. And it's very, very important to recognize that. And, and it's in some respects, the very antithesis of arbitration. Arbitration was 
developed as a process to resolve the particular dispute between the particular parties, whereas ISDS potentially has implications on entire populations because of uh, acts that the government uh, in one of its agencies has done or, or not done. So it is fundamentally different and I'm not at all surprised. And I do think, uh, as somebody said earlier on, that in 10 years time, we will see very significant uh, changes in the ISDS space because of the state interest in this area. I know, I know, I think Gary will not agree. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether Gary, can I ask you just very briefly, maybe, um, I don't know if you Perhaps want to. I should disagree on another occasion. <laughs> All right. So, well, the floor, the floor is yours if you want it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll move okay. on. Okay. Just, just very, very briefly. Um, of course, it's true there are differences between investor state and commercial arbitration. On the other hand, the techniques used for both types of arbitration are not dissimilar from those used in state to state arbitration, in sports arbitration, and in countless other fields. We ought to go back to something that was said previously, make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, because many of the procedures that we use to resolve investor state disputes actually work quite well. Uh, that will be definitely a topic for another plenary session, just, just after we have uh, discussed again costs and uh, inefficiencies. Uh, now, now let's move on quickly to uh, the virus. Um, we, we've been given, uh, I think, 10 more minutes of our time, so um, we do have a little bit of time on this. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge issue for everybody uh, because the world has completely changed. There are two different types of issue that I wanted to raise and get, the, get all your views on. The first are really policy issues, and that is the extent to which the impact and shape of dispute resolution might now be different um, in, in these times. Uh, and the second, which we can come to separately, are just the practical considerations of running and arguing cases remotely uh, and your experiences um, in different fora on that. Can I start with the first, which is to what extent do we think that the changes that have been, mean, have been forced upon us, the, the, the reset that we have had to do without actually deciding to do it, uh, to what extent is that going to stay? Is this now the beginning of a new system of uh, international arbitration and indeed uh, litigation? Can I, can I ask the Chief Justice first? Um, thank you, Toby. Uh, so I, I have spoken for a number of years about the importance of uh, technology and integrating technology into dispute resolution processes. And I, I think that the uh, pandemic uh, taught us three things. Um, it, it taught us first uh, what is possible. We went from uh, zero to you know, 60 more or less in a matter of days because we had anticipating some of the changes, we'd started deploying remote technology for certain types of hearings as early as February. Um, but I also recall, I have a distinct recollection of an appeal hearing before me where uh, the, the council teams were all in, in different locations. The court was in different locations. It was all by Zoom. But on each screen of the council team, there were about six people huddled around a little table. And I made the uh, observation to my team that this is not uh, going to be helpful at all if what it does is bring everybody even closer together within the confined space. So um, the point was we very quickly moved to a stage of, of really deploying uh, uh, Zoom hearings as the platform we're using for a lot of hearings. And the Court of Appeal, uh, for example, I would say close to 60 to 70% of cases in the last few months have been done by Zoom. And today the Court of Appeal has nearly caught up on all the backlog that built up during the circuit breaker period because we've been able to continue with the hearings. In the other levels of the court, We've been using Zoom hearings for directions matters for most applications where there isn't evidence. And it's primarily in cases where there's evidence, even there with remote witnesses or foreign witnesses, we've been doing it by video conferencing. So it has shown us what is possible. The second thing is the pandemic has forced us to realize what is necessary because actually by using the system, we have come to see that we can harness a lot of advantages and efficiencies. Uh, waiting time is gone, travel time is gone, uh, people's schedules can be accommodated a lot more uh, readily. Uh, for a lot of the directions, hearings, it comes to a point 
at least that's the goal, comes to a point where you're literally texted or messaged once uh, we're almost ready to go. So you don't have, you cut down the inefficiencies uh, tremendously. And I think that, um, you know, there are obviously some problems, a number of problems. I personally find, and a lot of the literature suggested this, that uh, these video conferencing hearings are a lot more tiring. I can tell you from my own experience that it's true of hearings, it's also true of meetings. Uh, I often feel completely wasted after a two or three hour uh, meeting. Uh, guess what's gonna happen immediately after we get off the slide? <laughs> but um, there are problems that we need to think about. I very much hope that this reality will encourage the development of really good quality bespoke platforms for hearings instead of you know, building on the meeting uh, platforms that, ha that have been generated. I really hope we will see that and I think we will see that. Uh, and I also really hope uh, at a personal level that this will help us make significant strides in the access to justice space by reducing the cost of access to justice and by enabling people to um, use technology more readily to get help. Can I, can I put the question uh, this way? Does the move to virtual hearings mean that we simply transpose what we were doing previously into a virtual setting, or does it mean that we rethink what we're doing in order to fit a new environment? Um, just, Justice Reyes, can I put that to you? At, at the moment, we're, we've just transposed, but I think we have to re configure, re, re, reconsider what we're doing. I don't think we've, we've really uh, realized, squeezed out the full implications of virtual remote technology. We still cling to a lot of, uh, I think, outmoded common law ideas about how evidence should be taken, how about cross-examination should be conducted, or what advocacy, what oral advocacy consists of. So I think those can be changed and uh, in time, developed as we realize the implications of what is possible with virtual technology. Um, like the Chief Justice, if I understood the Chief Justice correctly, I, I hope that this new normal is here to stay. In other words, we can't go back. We can only go forward and develop, build on what we have, and hopefully change things. There are a lot of um, procedural matters which um, I, I've been doing arbitrations um, through Zoom. I, I think we can improve upon. Uh, we can um, we can uh, build on and make much much more efficient. Uh, Lawrence. Well, I, I agree with uh, the observation so far. Uh, I think with Zoom meetings and and uh, remote hearings, we there's certain change. For example, I mean, uh, colleagues of mine who sit in arbitration often like hard copies. But with, with Zoom and with, with uh, remote hearings, we are all literally forced to uh, use electronic uh, case management document system and uh, having instantly on, on, uh, on the screen. I think they got used to it. So I think it is, it is here to stay, I'm for sure. And even when we go back to normal, in that sense, I'm sure aspects of what we have uh, uh, embarked on during this season will continue. I think um, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be here to stay. For in the long term, I think this is something very good. It hastens us to launch us into this uh, remote hearings and use of technology. In fact, there might be even uh, developed, like CJ says, uh, better technology to improve bespoke uh, um, software platforms for us to use. There could be uh, a better transcription, for example, as we speak. Uh, they, they are being recorded and can be transcribed instantaneously without need for uh, 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 a transcript writer. Or not, or, so things like that will develop, I'm, I'm quite sure. Natalie, how would you assess it um, from a mediation perspective? Um, so uh, before that, Toby, I think that the what's been very useful to make this permanent is we've seen a lot of um, institutional publication of guidelines on online case management protocol, cybersecurity, and so on, which would aid this as a permanent transition as to something that's simply temporary. Um, and as for the impact on mediation, I, I do think that with COVID-19 um, on two levels, there's a very positive um, impact that we will see on mediation. One, COVID-19 has brought with it global uncertainties and the types of disputes that we've seen have required innovative solutions with an emphasis on relationships 
um, and leveraging on the cost and time savings that mediation promises. So this mitigates in favor of a selection of mediation at this point in time to resolve the disputes that we see arising out of the COVID-19 situation. Um, and second, in terms of uh, the impact on mediation, how does technology promote um, mediation and its adoption. I think the question in that regard is a little bit, the answer to that question is a little bit more mixed uh, because mediation prides itself on being able to bring together personalities. But focusing on the positive, um, I, I'd like to think that with the onset of technological progress, we're going to be able to um, focus on things such as how technology is able to level the power play between um, between what may seem as dis disparate players uh, in a dispute, for example, which has been documented by some mediators, and where you can use a mix of synchronous and asynchronous uh, mediation processes to encourage slow thinking on some issues and fast thinking on other issues so that you may accelerate the resolution of the dispute through mediation. Um, but of course, you still need to overcome the very traditional aspects that Justice Reyes um, uh, referred to in a different context, where I'm looking at you now, uh, Toby, but it feels like I'm looking at everybody in the room. Um, and so in a, in a space where mediation, you use a subtle body language on the part of the mediator and the parties to suss each other out, you're less able to do that in an online context because you're simply connected to everybody at the same time, which is great in some situations, but got to find a way to manage that in others. I mean, and, and very similar, I can just say as advocate, it's a, incredibly difficult to make submissions, I think, through a camera and a screen because you have to, I have to now look at the camera in order for you to see my eyes, but I can't see anybody when I'm doing this because you're all down here. It's very, very difficult actually. I, I, want to, I want to round this off, if I may, with a question to Gary and then a question to the minister um, in terms of the impact of, of this, new, um, this new environment. Um, one of the features, it seems to me, one of, the, one of the consequences of this new world is that it's, very, it's a leveling that's happened. People have got access to arbitration and to the process from anywhere. Uh, there are people who may, may never have had actually um, the ability to join conferences um, or even to attend hearings perhaps, and now they can because location doesn't really matter so much. So the question I have for Gary first and then for the minister, firstly, Gary, does that have an impact on SIAC and its future? Um, if, if in fact Singapore, uh, if, if one doesn't have to travel to Singapore, if in fact the world of arbitration can be done so simply online, does that present a different challenge to an institution? And, and then after that, I wanted to ask the Minister uh, wh whether that presents a challenge to the government in terms of the way it promotes Singapore as a hub, because it won't be a hub perhaps in the same way in the future if infrastructure is no longer valued uh, and actually you can be anywhere around the world um, conducting the process. So first of all, Gary. It's a great question, Toby. I think it. I think the leveling effect, the the use of technology because of the pandemic, clearly does present a, a challenge both for SIC and and for Singapore. But after all, challenges are always opportunities, and I think this particular challenge is actually more opportunity than than challenge. It's an opportunity because Singapore isn't any longer beholden to the tyranny of geography. As a global arbitral institution, SIAC is on a level playing field, so to speak, vis-a-vis -vis European companies with the ICC, our principal competitor, with the AAA, with CTEC in the US and in China. And so I think there's an enormous opportunity for SIAC through its excellence as an institution, through Singapore as a trusted hub and legal regime for international arbitration. I'm sure the minister will go into the strengths of Singapore as a, a legal hub, but I think it has much more to do with the legal framework and the judiciary in Singapore than with other aspects, ge geography and the like. Thank you, uh, minister. Thanks, Toby. I, I think your question is, a, is an apt one. I think we. I agree with all my fellow panelists. I think we have moved to a stage where we can't move back anymore. I think this is, the platforms are here to stay. We are only going to be able to see more on the market, developing, as uh, CJ says, you know, uh, curated, uh, specialized platforms to go and conduct hearings instead of piggybacking on what the, what the existing uh, Zoom and Skype and so on uh, offer. Um, 
I, I think there is so much more to Singapore than just being a physical infrastructure. Uh, we have limitations in terms of people traveling here and the ability to travel and so on. But we are so much more, we have so much more to offer than just our physical spaces and, and Maxwell. We have a first class judiciary. Uh, when you talk about cultural intervention, we have uh, an SIC, you've heard Gary say, and I, I remember this very much, uh, next 10 years, we're going to see 60 to 70% increase in caseload. So I've noted that down. But I think that behind that is a confidence about the institution and the way in which the institution will, will keep reinventing itself, keeping updated. I mean, I said arbitration is really the mercantile response to litigation. And, and I think because of that, it's got to be responsive to commercial needs. We also have constant legal reform to support the product that we have, not just in terms of how easy and convenient it is to use, but also in safeguarding rule of law. And you know, along the lines of what we've been discussing in the early part of this discussion, all these points about time and costs and how to make arbitration a lot more attractive and a lot more open for parties to use. And I think all of that comes together. And I think perhaps this COVID pandemic has given us an opportunity to sharpen the focus on these points and to really uh, uh, look at these factors and how we distinguish ourselves from other jurisdictions and other, tribe, other institutions. I just want to add one other point to um, the comments earlier on using the online platform site. I, I, as counsel uh, before the court, I've not had a chance to use this kind of platform. I can fully understand how difficult it is to make that connection. And I think we, we do lose something too in that because we tell our, our young lawyers to watch the judges, watch the reaction, look at the different members of the Court of Appeal and you know, get a sense as to where that argument is hitting the right notes or not. And I think we lose a bit of that something. And the other thing that I feel we lose in the longer term is the value of mentorship. Because you know when, when you sit and wait for your turn in court uh, as a senior associate, you spend some time with your younger pupil or your trainee now, or younger lawyers, and I think you lose a bit of that connection. I know we uh, will gain a lot more in terms of time efficiency and uh, productivity, but I think you lose a little bit of something by not having that. So as we transition out of COVID, and I think we get back to a stage where we, we have the option of coming together and doing hearings, I think we must strike a balance because it can't just all be technology, and then we lose the value of human interaction and mentorship. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, very much. I, unfortunately, our time is up. We have, we've uh, got to page two of my 10 page outline. Um, but I want to thank everybody uh, enormously for what has been, I think, a, a very, very fruitful discussion uh, and a very candid discussion. And I think a lot of thoughts uh, which may be developed uh, in, in future events. And, and, a, and a very special thank you to the Pakistan Telecommunications for keeping me online. Uh, I think with that, uh, we, we will close. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Toby. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for the very engaging session. Uh, we would like to thank the panelists, especially the Honorable Chief Justice Menon, Minister Tong, and Justice Reyes for taking time from their busy schedules to participate in the SIC Virtual Congress 2020. We will now take a very brief break uh, and start the next session promptly at 12 p.m. Thank you and we'll see you soon.